Welcome to the uh, reunion weekend. And I think we've clearly grown up because there's no way we would have had this attendance on a sunny Friday afternoon when we were in school, especially in Boston. Uh, hi, my name is Brad Peterson, and I was, um, I was pleasantly surprised that I was chosen to introduce uh, Professor So and this topic, uh, sp especially because there's an extra little connection. Eric used to work at NASDAQ, and, uh, and I run um, technology at NASDAQ. So we have what everyone's calling the Magnificent Seven, and uh, NVIDIA happens to be one of those rising companies you might have heard of. So we, we regularly get to work with Jensen, the founder, Jensen Wong, and his team. And he talks about, you can tune in, he's, quite, he's out there these days, but he talks about the emergence of this new parallel infrastructure that they envisioned many years ago, and uh, that are really not replacing what we have today, but they are gonna be net new. And it's clear that a lot of the investment we're seeing is net new into this thing that he believes is gonna become the intelligence factories of the future. So if there's this synthetic intelligence that's, that's being delivered in this new infrastructure, it certainly plays a role in, in, in education and learning. So we happen to have a star in this field at, at MIT Sloan, and I'm happy to introduce you to Eric So. In addition to working at NASDAQ, um, he, he right now is an uh, economist and has chaired the professor in the glo and, he, and he is uh, chaired the professor in the global economics and management group at MIT, and he holds uh, the title of Sloan Distinguished Professor of Global Economics and Management. His research portfolio, in addition to AI, spans um, topics like asset pricing and trading, behavioral economics, regulatory policy, and market functions. And he also solves as the faculty chair of MIT Sloan's PhD program. He's an award-winning teacher and mentor, several years of experience advising and managing funds as well. So we can talk to him about the next NVIDIA. <laughs> uh, but the real exciting thing is Eric is spearheading the MIT Sloan Generative AI um, Hub for Teaching and Learning, which we're gonna talk about today. So without further ado, I wanna welcome Eric. Thank you so much. You. Hello, uh, good morning, welcome back. Uh, thank you so much for, for choosing hearing my lecture over the beautiful weather. I'm not sure my current students would have made that choice, but thank you. So uh, Brad uh, kindly mentioned, I'm a tenured professor in the Global Economics Group here uh, at Sloan. I teach a finance elective uh, here called Alphanomics, where I talk a lot about quantitative trading as well as behavioral finance, and this is gonna be relevant going forward. Uh, just as a little bit of note, uh, my friends, my family, my colleagues, they call me ESO as an abbreviation. Um, I always appreciate that nickname, but I've realized under certain accents that ESO sounds uncomfortably close to asshole. Uh, <laughs> I'm in denial about whether that's an accident. Uh, but most relevant today is that uh, I'm the lead faculty for the AI hub for teaching and learning. But getting to this point actually started with a specific date that I can trace back uh, to last year. So July 19th last year, uh, I had a significant uh, change in my career. And I know it's significant because I tracked my heart rate that day. So this is a plot from my Apple Watch of my beats per minute uh, over the course of that day. And I remember I posed to my students, I said, what do you think happened to me that day? And someone from this side of the room said, well, did you attempt CrossFit? And before I could ask why <laughs> it was attempt, someone from this side of the room said, no, 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 he's way too old for that. <laughs> <laughs> I had another student who, like a very deadpan, asked me, did you die? Uh, and I was stunned, uh, but fortunately, it was a Harvard undergrad, so don't worry. Uh, okay. <laughs> So instead, what was really happening is that I was first really understanding the implications of AI for education. So I have proof for this because I sent a note uh, to three people sitting in the dean's office. Uh, Deputy Deans Rodrigo Verdi and Ezra Zuckerman, as well as then uh, big uh, dean Dave uh, Schmidtlein. And so let me hone in on a couple of relevant points. I mentioned to them, I spent the morning feeling a bit frazzled. Uh, I tried out a new AI tool, and it honestly scared slash troubled me. Trying it out this morning made me realize that education and the broader economy are about to change very fast. Should we be changing what we teach, 
future employees won't be uh, required uh, to do nearly as much coding, and AI seems uh, already able to qualitatively assess the results of data analysis. So where did this come from? Well, I can tell you that the context for this came about as part of an assignment for my alphanomics class where I give students a data set and I ask them to analyze it. So here's a, data, uh, a problem set that I gave within my finance elective where I ask them to look at the efficacy of a strategy that uh, buys when sell-side analysts say buy and sells when they say sell. And as part of this, I give them a data set, I tell them about the variables, and then I ask them to do some analysis. And historically, this assignment took MBA students working in teams, roughly six, sometimes people would tell me 10 hours. And I tried it using ChatGPT's new data analysis tool where you can upload data sets and you can basically talk to the computer by telling it what you want done. The system did my assignment in under two minutes and it did it perfectly. So what do I mean? I uploaded the data set and without telling me, uh, giving it any other information, it read in all the variable names and it could tell contextually based on other variables that were next to it, what did those data variables mean? Uh, it also took a time to summarize and provide some summary statistics. But then it went further and I copied my homework assignment verbatim as I had written it into the AI system and you know what it did? It answered it perfectly. In fact, it didn't just conduct the data analysis, it was able to provide context and understand the meaning underlying what the patterns revealed. Further, when I asked it to do a bit more detailed analysis, it was able to generate fancy graphs, provide captions, and understand what those graphs meant. So this really scared me. But what scared me even more is that when I was asked, it provided the underlying code that was used to generate the analysis. Now why is this a problem? It's because when many people hear about AI, they say, well, I'm just gonna have my students show their work, and so maybe when I ask them to do data analysis, they'll simply provide the underlying code that will prove to them that this works. That's not actually the case anymore because it can provide the code, it can convert it in any way that you like, and that really poses a significant challenge to us. So that motivates this email that I sent to the dean's office saying, really, I think we need to think about how we change education here at Sloan. So if you've ever uh, heard of the phrase, no good deed, you may understand what came up next. I was voluntold, okay, to uh, lead a, a three-front effort to prepare Sloan for teaching and learning in the age of AI. So what is this three-front effort? There's three real pieces to it. The first uh, is an AI hub, which I'll tell you a little bit more. It's a public-facing website about AI resources that pertain to education. We've been doing a number of town hall demos where we showcase the technology to various constituencies around Sloan. And finally, this semester, I taught a class on AI to faculty, which I'll tell you a bit more about. So if you go onto MIT Sloan Ed Tech, you will see this website uh, for generative AI for teaching and learning. And on that website, you'll see this video of me with this very unfortunate freeze frame for me appearing to sell you, let's say, car insurance. But if you can look past that image, you'll notice there's a lot of useful content here regarding AI basics. Uh, how do you get started, some of the terminology? How do you think about the tools that can be used? Additionally, we provide uh, background information in terms of thinking about ethical issues and information that you can use within your syllabus. And so as part of this, we're trying to make sure that we distribute information that could be useful and sort of uh, distilled for, for uh, teachers to use. Additionally, I ran a class this semester, and I will say I've taught a lot of MBA and undergrad students over my 12 plus years here at Sloan, but I've never had quite the challenge of teaching tenured faculty how to do something. This was a whole new challenge. And what, was my, what were my goals in this class? My goals were twofold. The first is I wanted to show people how to use AI uh, in terms of running a class more efficiently and, and potentially improving their class. Additionally, was to equip faculty with the skills to teach uh, other people how to use AI. So for example, as part of this class, we built custom chatbots for purposes of answering questions about uh, the syllabus and material. We also created uh, custom tutors that were able to sort of meet students where they were in terms of what they were understanding and work with them without just directly giving them the answer. We used AI grading assistance to help improve grades and give more in-depth feedback. And what was so nice about this is it freed up time for faculty to work on developing more substantive material. Additionally, we redesigned a lot of assignments with AI in mind, knowing that the future workforce is going to involve people working alongside of AI. 
Additionally, what was so critical to this class is we wanted to use faculty as a vehicle to distribute information about AI skills throughout our, our, our students. So we started with basic things like effective, effective prompting, how to think about how to interact in a productive way. But then we also used it for more, slightly more advanced uh, materials such as for coding and visualizing data, and reducing the barriers that often scare people away from data analysis. And then we talked about building more complex models with AI workflows, building things like LangChain or customized fine-tuned models. So these classes were in person, and this was quite necessary because I think a big portion of the uh, learning curve for working with AI really requires you to be hands-on, to make some mistakes, to learn from those mistakes and try to improve. Additionally, uh, the participants, we had 20 plus, at one point we had 30 faculty that were involved in this program. It was a mix of tenure track and teaching faculty. And we intentionally, we had representation from all the Sloan core courses. And the basic idea is that we would have those faculty make AI changes within their class and see that distributed through the core. So we were pretty proud of what we accomplished in the sense that the faculty seemed really excited about it. We could see immediate changes in terms of what they plan to do in their fall courses. Um, but we're not complacent in the sense that we recognize that in this changing AI landscape, it's really important for us as leaders or innovators within the education space to keep thinking about new approaches. So what are those new approaches? Well, what I would say is we're gonna rerun and expand this peer-to-peer -peer program, hoping to reach more faculty. We're also running an AI boot camp for incoming MBA students. Some of you may be of the vintage do you remember coming in where there was Excel taught as a basic uh, prerequisite to start the core. Now it's gonna be AI, learning to work with AI in a productive fashion. Additionally, we're gonna be having classes that are expanded offerings which are specifically uh, uh, working to develop AI skills. So using more complex models, uh, working with fine tuning or LangChain. And then one thing I want to flag for you, because there's so many successful alumni in the group, we're working uh, on developing an AI lab class where uh, companies submit projects that they're hoping are to solve with AI, and from that, have students help you try to solve that problem uh, as part of their semester of learning here. And because the students are so hungry for hands-on experience applying AI, I think there's a lot of synergies to be had, but I'll tell you more about that at the end. So, my big picture comment is I do think there's a risk of overhyping AI in, in the sort of the near, uh, the sort of immediate term. There's a lot of credible folks in the AI space who say AI is as important as fire. Now, these, this is a very polarizing statement, but what can be lost in that is that AI seems quite, uh, is here to stay, and it's poised to change how the economy and education work over the next couple decades. And it's really time for us to prepare, and our students need to be equipped to be ready to enter that workforce. So what I wanna do is spend a couple minutes talking about the power and pitfalls of AI, thinking about what's, how they work, and a little bit about uh, some of the research that we're seeing. So an important part of what makes us intelligent as human beings is that we can take information that has happened in the past to understand the context to make a prediction about the future. Now, a lot of AI models like LLMs are attempting to replicate that aspect of intelligence by using information from the past or context to help predict what's gonna happen next. And these LLMs, they're trained on millions and millions and millions of bits of context, particularly uh, words from books, from the internet, uh, and from chats, et cetera. Although this is expanding to other types of formats, including video uh, and, uh, and, and audio. So, Here's a, a very simple version of an LLM. So an LLM is this black box. So what is this black box doing? This black box is serving as a prediction framework. So we take an input, like the cat sat on the, or elementary, my dear, or elementary, yeah, my dear, and the output is, will typically be the next word that accompanies that. So cat sat on the typically accompanies the word mat. Okay, so what's actually happening behind the hood, though, if we double click on this first example, is the following. The cat sat on the is fed into the LLM, and what is the LLM doing under the hood? What the LLM is doing under the hood is it's building this probability table on the right. And what do those probability values mean? They mean that roughly 5% of the time, in the context of the internet, of books, of uh, chats, cat sat on the, the next word that typically follows is fridge roughly 5% of the time. Conversely, the most common word is mat. The cat sat on the mat happens roughly 20% of the time. Uh, and roughly 0% of the time, the cat sat on the zebra. So 
what the LLM does is it takes the word that is typically most represented in that probability distribution and it appends it to the original prompt, feeds it back into the LLM until it reaches what's called an optimal stopping condition. Now, notice what's happening here is that they're drawing from over this probability table to effectively figure out what is the most likely next word. But in its output, when it gives you back information, it typically tends to follow this distributional pattern. What does that mean? That means that the 100 queries that put in the phrase, the cat sat on the, roughly 5% of the time, the LLM is going to give back the word fridge. And what does that do? That ensures that the distribution of the outputs typically follow what's found in internet and books. And so this can help explain, if you've ever used an LLM, why it can produce different bits of output if you enter the same prompt over multiple times. So from this, there's also a process through reinforcement learning. And what happens is that the AI model learns to recognize what do you like? What do humans like in terms of their response? So if you ask, for example, to explain the difference between these two terms, it will give you an output. And then notice what's happening on the upper right. There's this thumbs up, thumbs down button. And what is that doing? We're learning from that system about what do you like and what you don't like, and the model gets essentially retrained based on responses that humans tend to like or dislike. And over time, that allows the LLM to give overall better responses. It's basically learning to think like a human, or at least in the way that humans want the LLM to think. So based on this, it has this really powerful, powerful uh, uh, ability. So I teach a class here as the PhD program director in addition to my MBA teaching, a class on effective communication for PhD students, which I've nicknamed how to talk good and write gooder. Uh, and as part of this, I have this, this really nice book that I like called The First Minute about establishing context. And what I'm able to do is take the entire book, I'm able to drop it into Google's AI Studio, which is an LLM like ChatGPT. It can read in the entire book, and as part of this, it can generate for me 20 different slides that summarize each chapter within that book and essentially allows me to just take those bullet points, copy it directly into a, a, a PowerPoint, and there I have a slide presentation. And so, of course, this is just one example. It could also use AI as a co-writer. I use it all the time. So today, or yesterday, in preparing for this talk, I went to ChatGPT, and I said, listen, I really like Stephen Colbert, and I'm here to welcome back MIT Sloan alum. Help me write uh, something for the reunion weekend. And it wrote me the following. It says, welcome back to MIT Sloan. We've missed you. Well, most of you are your tuition fees, but you get the point. <laughs> and it wrote a long dialogue, and not everything is golden. I wouldn't use it all today. But what it is an example of is how people can kind of work alongside AI. Additionally, yesterday, I took this picture of myself because AI is more than just text. When people hear the term LLM, or large language model, they get in the mindset that it's just about text. But the nature of these prediction models is such that it can handle other types of format, including audio and video. So here I took a picture of myself uh, holding the sign that says, hello, MIT, and it says, explain this video. And it says, here's a, piece of, a, a person holding a piece of paper with the message written, hello, MIT. It talks about the cert that I'm wearing. It talks about my office. And so what does that illustrate? It illustrates that we're able to work with a lot of unstructured data in formats that would typically require humans to be involved. So when I think about why AI is so powerful, it's because it can reach beyond simple writing tasks. Now, a lot of people are surprised that LLMs are quite useful as creative agents. And what do I mean by that? A lot of people think about LLMs as just being this robot that can't really come up with something creative like a human. Well, actually, it's really important to recognize that new ideas are often based upon connecting existing concepts or ideas. And really, that's what the LLM is all about. When it's training the model, it's trying to find connections between things that are not always obvious to humans. So LLMs are really powerful as a means to generate creative ideas, to iterate, and to think about potential uh, things that humans are missing. So there's a number of research studies that talk about the implications for AI. One of the most obvious is that students who have access to AI suddenly can do a lot more a lot faster. So here's a study written by some MIT research affiliates that talk about the time taken uh, for workers when giving a writing assignment. And what's plotted in this graph are differences between a control and treatment sample that were given access to LLM in the post-treatment period and given them a common writing task. And what you can clearly see is people are able to complete these tasks much faster. That's not surprising because the AI is quite good at writing. 
Additionally, though, what was uh, notable is that the people who had access to AI not only wrote faster, they had better grades. But this improvement in grades was not uniform. It affected certain types of subpopulations differently. What did the researchers find? It found that the students who benefited the most from having access to AI were the ones who were the poorest uh, graders on the first assignment. So the students who really struggled, for example, in writing, and it benefited the most from having access to AI. So when we think about AI changing education, we think about changing economy, there are all sorts of welfare issues that are coming about, in part because we're, uh, we're having giving people access to this alternative brain that they could use as a co-pilot. Additionally, there was this really nice study uh, looked at what happens with computer programming. So I mentioned from the outset that AI is really powerful as a coding assistant. So the, there was a controlled experiment in which they gave uh, engineers access to AI uh, and then uh, some that did not. And what did they find? They found two principal things. Of those people who were given the assignment, the people who were given access to AI were a lot more likely to actually finish the assignment. They could actually complete the task. The second thing that's happened is that the people who did complete it, so everyone who completed it, the people who had access to AI finished it roughly 50% faster. Now, if you think about that, that's a very profound result. Why? It's because it's highlighting the fact that when you give people access to these AI systems, they can complete their tasks like coding. What this allows people to do is free up time for other types of tasks that either may be more productive or more fulfilling. And so I think about the implications of AI as being quite broad in reshaping the nature of work. Now, I've talked a lot about AI being this powerful, great thing, but the news is not all good, so let me try to flag a couple things. One of that's front and center to us is this notion that AI is gonna very much change the nature of education. So one of our uh, graduates uh, from our PhD program, Ethan Mollick, talks a lot about AI representing the homework apocalypse. So, in part, you may have had discussions with people that say, can you detect AI? And let me show you the answer is no. But then you'll say, aren't there services designed to detect AI? Yes, there are, but there's a lot of services that will sell you things. The question is, do they work? So why is that the case? To the extent they work at all, they can be defeated simply by using slight changes in prompt. So people like to see these headlines that say, oh, if you see the word delve in a statement, well, that tells you that an AI is being used. Well, guess what? If I go to the AI and say, don't use the word delve, it does exactly that. Additionally, detectors have a lot of high false positive rates where sometimes they'll detect non-native speakers as having used AI when they haven't. And so it creates a lot of potential inequity issues. The implications for educators is that students are using it, they're gonna to continue to use it. It's, um, some faculty have resorted to saying, no AI in my classroom, and I just say, I'm sorry, I think it's a bit too late for that. I think it's, if people are using it, you have to sort of adapt. So we shift more towards, uh, for example, at Sloan we're already starting to see shifting more towards in-person evaluation and paper exams. We're also thinking about uh, training students to new types of tasks, like discerning good AI output from bad AI output, AI skills, meaning how to do more advanced techniques within the value chain that they can help uh, sort of reduce costs, and also just thinking about what are the tasks that I even want to assign to AI. So research shows that LLMs can be problematic. Why is that? It's in part because if you remember from the opening uh, slide, LLMs are trained on information from the internet, from books, which is great, maybe, I guess, but also from chat functions and also, for example, YouTube message boards. And if you've ever been on a YouTube message board, you'll know that the stuff there is really uh, problematic. So you can see that LLMs display biases against women and minorities. It tends to reinforce stereotypes. It could also hallucinate, meaning it could tell you that there is some uh, thing that is true, which it clearly is not. There's also evidence that AI can, in some circumstances, make people lazy or careless in the sense that we flex muscles, creative muscles, uh, and then when we rely too much on AI, we struggle when we move away from AI. Lots of big picture questions that we're still grappling with as a society. So another central challenge, of course, is that AI is really, really good at generating fake content. So these are all fake images that were generated by, uh, by OpenAI's uh, DALI system. And notice that they look pretty realistic. And moreover, this is something that was generically available. One of the future concerns about AI is that it makes it so cheap to develop material that's specifically designed to trigger some portion of your emotion, something that they know that really bothers you. It's quick and cheap to generate. And so one of the big picture questions that we're really grappling with as researchers, as a society, reminds me of this quote that I saw from this German philosopher, which is if everybody lies to you, 
The consequence is not that you believe the lies, but rather that nobody believes anything any longer. So a really important question for us to think about as leaders is how do we deal with uh, this misinformation environment that's surely likely to proliferate in the very near future? So one thing I will flag for you is there's a lot of research happening here at MIT. I'm very fortunate to be part of a research group called the Initiative on the Digital Economy. The IDE brings together a number of researchers who are tackling, tackling topics that are clearly about the digital economy, but everything these days is about AI. So we're thinking about AI in the context of finance, in terms of misinformation, in terms of uh, labor economics. And if you're interested, uh, this website is clearly public facing. There's lots of ways uh, to be involved. Just giving you guys a little bit of perspective in terms of what history has taught us about where we're likely to go, I wanted to just offer a couple slides. So there's this really nice book among many that I recommend to people to understand this current wave that we're in, one of which is uh, this book by Mustafa Suleiman, who's now at Microsoft, called The Coming Wave. And what it talks a lot about are, are the very similarities across different technological waves throughout history. So for example, the factory uh, systems that uh, happened during the Industrial Revolution, the printing press, electricity, and so forth, what happens is that they often start out as these sort of like niche products, and they have very high costs. But what it allows people to do is to generate more goods, faster, cheaper, better, and this creates more demand for people to uh, increase more access to that technology. And that competition drives more and more adoption, and over time, it becomes very widely available. I think we're already starting to see that play out now. Additionally, uh, there's this notion in technology economics called the J-curve. It's this idea that many technologies kind of start out quite small, perhaps they become quite niche, and eventually they, they explode. Now, computing, for example, was typically started out as this very niche subject that was done in laboratory basements at universities and maybe a couple computer science groups. But like everything else, uh, all these other technologies, they quickly transform the nature of work. However, it comes with a catch. As we're thinking about the nature of uh, the future of the economy and society, a really important consideration is in thinking about how this will affect different aspects of the economy, meaning that AI doesn't affect everyone the same way. So if you look at the data, you see this very clear pattern. So what I'm gonna ask, because I know there's a lot on the screen, is for you to draw your eyes specifically to the graph on the left. What is the graph on the left? This is a graph of different income uh, growth over the past 70 years across different levels of education represented uh, first at the top by graduate degrees and at the bottom by people who are high school dropouts. And what you can very clearly see is the stark increase in income inequality in real terms across uh, these different generations. And when you look closely at the data, what it reveals is that the people who are well positioned to take advantage of this computing age or this knowledge and professional age were the ones who really benefited the most. AI uh, poses a similar uh, issue in thinking about who has the ability to really access and make use of some of these uh, lower cost technologies and in making people more productive. AI could easily contribute to these polarizing trends. So what's the message here? I underscore to my students the importance of staying uh, up to date in terms of AI, and particularly as the, the, uh, the type of technology evolves quite quickly. And when asked, I've given my students the following advice. And I've uttered this phrase roughly 100 times, maybe in the past couple months, which is, the real risk to our students is not that they are replaced by AI, but rather that they are replaced by someone who knows how to better use AI. And so what that means is that it's really important to teach people how to embrace this technology in a productive way. And staying up to date is this growing imperative. So for this, I've been asked to give all sorts of talks at school boards, at companies, at different groups within Sloan. And I noticed at first that I started uh, having a lot of disorganized messages. And I thought about it when people say, gosh, it seems so intimidating. How do you get started with this? Or what are the different aspects you mean when you say stay up to date? I created this framework along with one of my colleagues called the ADAPT to AI framework. And what does that mean? It means the A within ADAPT means first, a first important step is really to assess. There's so many different products out there that are changing very fast, and I think it's quite important to understanding some of these expanded capabilities. The second is to define, this is the second in this acronym, thinking about potential use cases and stuff that is within your typical work domain that could easily be automated, something that an AI could be good at, and think about how you could potentially use AI to solve that problem. 
The second, which is really critical, and I think an often important discussion for folks who are running organizations, is that allocation of resources is really key. Thinking about time and attention, but also having access for people to understand how AI can work within their workflows. For example, there's a lot of evidence now that if you ask employees, they're not waiting for management to decide whether they should allow, be allowed to use AI. They're not waiting for an enterprise license. Instead, what they're doing is they're bringing AI from home. Essentially, the absence of corporate policies is pushing AI a little bit into the shadows as people try to understand uh, how it could be applied for their jobs. So I think as leaders of organizations, it's really important to confront that reality and think about what that means for your firm. The most important of this acronym is the P, which is the pilot. I tell people all the time, and they kind of chuckle, but I think this is important, that you should try to use AI for all the tasks for which it is legally and ethically permissible. Meaning there's a lot of tasks that you may not recognize AI is quite good at. So when I say I use AI every day, really what I mean is oftentimes I'm struggling with something, I'm working on a particular task, and then I try to see whether AI can help me with this particular adventure. It doesn't always do a good job, but what it allows me to do is figure out where are the places where AI can be particularly helpful and capable. The final of this ADAPT framework is really to transform. And what's so critical, in my opinion, is that the need for organizations and leaderships to foster this environment where AI is not something that is shunned, but it is potentially useful. But it has to be done in a legally and ethically permissible way. But that comes down from senior management, and that's really where you guys as future leaders, I hope you give this some thought. So in talking to school boards and talking to organizations, one of the things that I've recommended is that for any one individual, this can create a lot of duplicated efforts. So I recommend to folks thinking about this ADAPT task force, which is of course just the fancy nay of saying, let's get together some people from different constituencies to think about how AI could be used within your organization. And why I think this is so helpful is it can help reduce a lot of redundant efforts, uh, thinking about people who are trying the same uh, application, considering technological, physical, ethical issues as you're adopting to AI, helps you map what's called the jagged frontier. So you hear a lot of economists talking about this. It's this notion that if you draw the frontier of what's possible with AI, there's gonna be some tasks that you do that are within inside the realm of AI, meaning that AI can help you, and there's gonna be some that are on the outside. But it's not always clear ex ante which one it will be good at, and helping to map that frontier will help your organization. Additionally, there's so much noise these days about AI, and the trick is we need to be able to sift through that in a productive way. So, just thinking about it from a big picture uh, perspective, I think AI offers significant promise to reshape work, giving us more time for things that we find more interesting, more valuable, more fulfilling. But that optimistic vision of us being more productive, more fulfilled is not a given. It's something that we need to work towards. And leaders of organizations, meaning you guys, as well as uh, us at Sloan, we need to be thinking about whether and how to commit resources to build in AI within our organization in a way that's mutually beneficial, it's safe, and it's ethical. In other words, it's really time, if we're not already, thinking about using AI in a responsible and organized way. So it's really important to plan for the future. One thing I will say is that there are probably people here today that have used uh, LLMs or AI systems, and they've typed something in, and they found that it gave you problematic output. And then they kind of give up. They say, oh, this stuff is a little bit gimmicky. The issue is that the LLMs are something that involve a, a learning curve. It's also the case that the technology is improving so fast. Many of the issues and limitations of AI that existed a year ago don't exist today. And I see that trajectory only continuing. So really what's important is not to just build for what's possible today, but to be thinking about what's gonna be possible in the very near future. So just wrapping up, because I know I'm over time, let me say a couple things. I know the purpose of today's talk was really to think about AI and education. So don't worry, I feel like AI, uh, we're in good hands here at Sloan, or at least we're, we're really making a good effort. So when I think about the implications of AI, I think of it in three categories, delivery, evaluation, uh, and in terms of skills. So in terms of delivery, what are we doing? The MBA classroom's looking quite different these days in the sense that we're setting up uh, AI tutors and chatbots to help students get very detailed feedback outside of office hours. We're using this as a means to give more in-depth feedback to understand what students are getting wrong. And what's really important though that's missing is it's not just about saving time, it's about substituting to higher value tasks where faculty can spend less time answering emails, for example, instead thinking about content creation, stuff that students really need to know. 
In terms of evaluation, well, we're, so far we're seeing a return of in-person exams and in, in evaluation just because we know that computer systems can answer a lot of questions. If we really want to uh, make sure that students are really engaging in the material, and moreover, that we don't harm people or give them worse grades if they don't use AI. We're also just simply asking more of students. Now that students have access to these systems, it's not that we keep the sort of the, the amount that we ask of them the same. We expect more of people, and I think that's what also you're going to see within jobs. A really key important uh, lesson is discerning good AI output from bad AI output because it can all sound so credible, and it's really important for managers to make sure that we understand some of these differences. And finally, in terms of skills, there's very basic stuff, things about effective prompting that I think is so key, but more advanced processes like building lang chain models as well as custom processes. Uh, fine tuning and building models, I think, is really going to be an important skill set for a lot of organizations. Stuff here at Sloan that we're trying to teach our MBA students to equip them to make sure that they're ready for the next uh, generation of work. So my last slide is uh, a branded slide. So I'm Eric So. So this title slide is titled Eric So What, So What's Next? So what Eric So What, I really think this AI boom represents a pivotal shift in tech that's likely to be more impactful than the internet. So if you think about the internet providing access to information, I think of AI as improving our ability to act on it. In terms of what's next, I do think there's a risk of overhyping the technology. People talk a lot about P-Doom or singularity and those sorts of issues. However, I think the bigger risk, at least to us in the media term, is not appreciating the impact that it's likely to have on the future of the economy. We need to prepare our students for the future of work, and we want your help. So what do I mean by that? There's a lot of things that are happening here at Sloan. There's a lot of research that's happening uh, through various groups uh, in terms of this IDE research group, among others. There is an AI hub if this is something that your organization is interested in. And if you are interested with your organization in partnering with MIT and working with uh, Sloanies on potential projects, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email address is just my nickname, eso at, uh, at mit.edu. So I apologize if I run a bit over, but let me say it was so wonderful to see so many Sloanies back and to, to know that you chose me over this very beautiful weather that's outside. I'm super grateful and I'm glad to stick around for questions. So thank you guys very much. Should I please? Oh, okay, sorry. I should ask if there's any questions. Uh, oh yes, uh, st still learning the ropes here, yes. Well, I think for AI has been so, I'm sorry? Oh, yes, so the question is like, how did, how did, I, how did I get to this moment where we're uh, thinking about uh, allocating so much to AI? And it, like, I think an uh, important part of that process is that I've always been interested in how uh, the economy is unfolding over time, and technology in particular, how it's shaping how we work, how we live. And so certainly I spent a lot of my time, for example, studying issues related to fake news. And when I saw the implications of AI for some of the things I hold near and dear, it became a natural uh, connection point. Uh, yes? Yeah, a question um, related to the chat. Yes. Um, I think what that made me think of when you said in the end we all end with probably the chat more likely to center on the Mac and the user is that AI is sort of this very good real to real. And the one way is to have Yeah, there's a lot of uh, concern about this notion of, of AI, AI feedback. Essentially, I ask the AI what I think is right, and I tell other people that whatever the AI said is right, and it becomes a circular process. And so I think a really important part of that, and why we think it's so important for our students to, to double down in understanding the material, is that they can't always rely on AI, and they need to know whether something is a good idea. So part of what we think is in a really critical skill is not just succumbing to whatever the AI outputs and instead thinking about the, the broader concepts. It's a really good point. It's something that we're grappling with. Yes? So I have an observation about open feedback. Yeah. Feedback. One part of this is that Open 
So I, I think uh, at least the, the second question I, I understood to be, how do we think about AI given some of the security risks uh, un underlying, for example, proprietary information? So certainly there's a number of enterprise opportunities where uh, LLM systems can be sort of walled off from outside, uh, you know, um, the outside world. And certainly this is front and center to the minds of, of many AI providers and thinking about providing data security. So for example, one of the tools that we've been teaching people here about Sloan is a, uh, is a, is a product called Stack AI that uh, allows to build these custom workflow chains in a very cheap way. And they, they promise uh, data security, which MIT technology has signed up for, signed off on, which is no easy feat. Uh, and I'm sorry, what was the first question? Yes. Well, I, I, <laughs> that's a tricky question. I will say that this is a really important reason for organizations to understand what portions of their workflow are most uh, useful to AI. And for that, I think the workers are often the best people to be able to help figure that out. The question is, does the company uh, allow for AI in the sense that people promote a culture in which AI is acceptable? Because what's happening now is a lot of people are using AI, but they're not telling their managers about it in fear, for fear of two reasons. One is that people don't want to get in trouble, so they don't want to report that they're actually using it and risking some data issue. The second is that they don't want to be, uh, a lot of people fear that by showing that AI can do some of their work, they're going to simply be replaced. And I don't think that's the right mindset, particularly if companies can sort of foster this idea that AI could be quite useful, cost-saving, and beneficial for the organization. Yes? So Okay, so apocalyptic. I'm not sure how to, to handle that. Uh, I, I, I have no uh, research on this subject. I, I will say that there is, like many other technological revolutions, there's likely to be some displacement and you'll see certain types of industries move over. In the sense, for example, we've already seen what's happening within the economy that there is this reallocation towards people with AI skills. There's less investment in other types of, of jobs and skill sets that are not uh, as, as much needed now that AI can, uh, can be useful. Uh, and so I think it's, it's a really important question that a lot of organizations are trying to figure out. And the real trick, and the reason why I can't give you such a definitive answer, or you know, many reasons I can't give you a definitive answer, is because AI is changing so quickly that it's hard to forecast what's going to be relevant in a year from now. Uh, and so it's, uh, you know, if you have additional thoughts on this, please do let me know. Yes? I think we should be encouraging kids to interact with AI in much the same way that we teach undergrads or MBA students to be thinking about AI. It requires uh, an experimentation I, it, with the, in a supervised and ethical way. But I also think it just means an understanding the importance of, of really understanding the material themselves, not simply using the AI. If there are parents in the room who have young kids, I guarantee you that much of what students are being assigned now can pretty easily be done by an LLM including things that involve under working with charts or figures, because as I showed, LLMs are quite good at, for example, processing image. So I think we need to embrace that uh, students are going to be using this, but also make sure that we design systems that uh, evaluate whether they're actually absorbing the material. So yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, uh, sorry, yes. The boundaries of the boundaries of the ethics. Or maybe say the gray something that's in the gray area that you prefer, but you know, give yeah. us some insight into how you're thinking about Yeah, so one of the things one of the things that we uh, have really uh, preached when we've trained people thinking about AI uh, skills is that there are many tasks which uh, are you know, just 
for AI, repetitive basic tasks. There are some tasks that are hybrids, meaning that we can evolve AI, but we monitor. And there are some tasks that are never AI, in the sense that, for example, I think many people are uncomfortable with the idea of there being like an AI priest that officiates weddings or something to that effect. But the trick is in figuring out like what are the, uh, and this, I, I'm sorry if I'm reinforcing your question, but it really depends on what you view as really central to something being human, and particularly where the risks are in letting AI be involved. But that, and I think, is very domain or task specific. Uh, yes? Yeah, so in this idea of learning and being conditioned by it, I'm thinking about your work for fake news. One of the challenges with AI is the challenge of the mission element, which is that we never address the issue of identity and ensuring that we know who it is that's standing behind. Yeah, so an important question in dealing uh, the, the, in terms of training peop, uh, leaders and, and our students is in thinking about how to sort of make sense of good AI versus bad AI. That's the broader category I was referring to. And thinking about what's right and what's not. I can also tell you that there's a lot of research going into now thinking about how we respond, for example, to fake news and how this changes our perceptions. Uh, and so, for example, a number of my colleagues are working on really innovative research that looks at the implications of AI and fake news for political outcomes, which is very central these days. Uh, but I will say, uh, I, the, the, the sort of some of these topics, I can refer you to research, but if you reach out, I'm more than happy to connect. So I probably have time for one last question, and then, I'll, yes. Yeah, so uh, thinking about piloting uh, applications of AI within your workflow. So for example, uh, AI, uh, knowing what it's quite good for, uh, what I often use it for every day now is in terms of coding. I write a lot of code and it's particularly powerful. Uh, I think in terms of brainstorming, I think it's incredibly powerful. Now it'll generate a lot of ideas which you don't like, but it also provides uh, some that I think spark some interest. The other piece is interest, just trying to automate very basic repetitive tasks and, uh, and in turn, particularly once you can uh, fine tune or at least give clear guidance to AI systems, they're incredibly powerful if you just know how to use them right. So let me say this, uh, I, typic I have a rule when I teach at Sloan, which is that you can finish early, but you can't finish late. So I apologize, I'm already running a minute over. But let me say it was such a pleasure to, to see all of you here, to welcome you back, and I just really wanna thank you and uh, let me know if there's anything that you need. So thank you guys very much.